Time is too long to those who mourn, too short to those who laugh. To those who love, time is eternity. Theodore Klein. This property and, and Theodore Klein together are really a unique piece of horticultural and agricultural history. In the early stages of, of the nursery industry, you went out and you hired all the strong backs you could find in March or April. And very few people out, were out there with a lot of background in nursery production and landscape horticulture. And then around November, you'd lay everybody off. And then the next spring, you'd start all over again. Theodore was one of the people who saw the value of accumulated knowledge in an employee. And so he would bring people out in the spring to work in his nursery and his landscape business. But he oftentimes would keep them on through the winter working on projects here on the farm and on the property. It was his way of retaining that accumulated knowledge so that in the spring you weren't starting from square one. While he was a wholesale producer and he grew 20,000 of this and 10,000 of that and 50,000 of another thing, a large chunk of the grounds he used as a place to test out other plants. And so he collected plants from wherever he could find them and he brought them in and put them out on the grounds in gardens and used that as a way to evaluate whether they were worthwhile plants for this region. What I've heard from family is that for a, you know, a 10 to 20 year period during its heyday of the farm, pretty much flour, sugar, and coffee were the main staples that they brought in. They had beef cattle, they had dairy cows, they had hogs and chickens, they had tree fruit orchards and grapevines and uh, vegetable gardens and canning cellars. And there were not a whole lot of farms in this part of the world that were that self-sufficient through that full period of time. You know, that was something that was more common much earlier. And so he combined a place to raise his family with a place to develop a commercial nursery of ornamental plants with a working production farm uh, all in one place. His family had come over to work in the vineyards in the Cincinnati area. That was a big wine growing area. It is no longer. And uh, he was self-taught. We have essentially his high school and college education in his old library of books that he collected. He taught himself to weld, and the chandeliers that are in the castle are ones that he forged himself. He traveled in Europe and brought back things that he thought would be castle scale, furniture and the andirons in the fireplace. He taught himself to carve, and so on the castle are several of his carvings. Above the, the castle door, the door to the castle, is a carving that Theodore Klein did that was a sundial. And it above it is this part of this poem. Time is too long to those who mourn, too short to those who laugh, but to those who love, time is eternity. As long as I can remember, I remember seeing this and thinking about it. It really makes you think, especially I mean, me as a kid reading it for the first time with no sense of our value of time. It really puts things in perspective. But to those who love, time is eternity. Just thinking about how my grandparents, they were and Lee, crazy in love all their whole lives together. Just, it's really sweet. He always said he built this for her. So big and strong that he was, but she passed two years before he passed. It was really jolting to, to see him to come into the kitchen and he'd be weeping openly, he missed her so much. He said, I built it all for her. And they were they were just such a two-headed monster, they were great. You could walk in any evening, daytime, they're both going two different directions, but at mealtime they're there, and then late at night watching the news or some horrible, um, nighttime miniseries, oh. um, but they would be just talking, holding hands, and just sharing their day with each other. I remember uh, 
that there was always, in the kitchen, there was always a box on the wall that housed a radio. And this radio was the main communication between Martha Lee, who was stationed in the house, and then my grandfather, Theodore, who was out in the field digging trees. So the telephone would ring. There was one telephone, and that was for business and personal. So the telephone would ring, an order would come in, because this was a wholesale business. So an order would come in for the trees, and then my grandmother would take the order, and she would then be use the radio to communicate with my grandfather, Theodore, to say, so-and-so business just called, they need however many trees dug, and they want it delivered by such and such. So that would be the order. Meanwhile, Martha Lee was in the kitchen cooking lunch, because every day, that every working day, well actually seven days a week, Martha Lee was making a hot lunch for her husband. And so then my grandfather would come in at lunchtime, have his hot meal, then go back out in the field and work with his um, crew to get things done. And then, and also, is another um, part of the, her contribution to the business, she kept all the books. She did all the bookkeeping and accounting. Oh, bless her heart, she had to do so much with us underfoot um, throughout the summertime. I keep looking up at the kitchen. Where is she? Um, mm, we could do no wrong, but we, were, we weren't too wild and crazy. Uh, but we must have worn around. We grandkids were her little shadows. Papa would go off and do whatever he needed to do. But she was always there, just the ringmaster of the circus of grandkids, whoever dropped by, telephone, and what needed to be made in preparation for the next meal or the next day. You know, Mark Lee and Theodore's um, house was always, they always had an open door for everyone. At the end of the driveway, there was a gate, but the gate was never closed. They loved having visitors. I have heard of Theodore Klein through the grapevine and arranged to meet him. He was 83 years old, it was right after his open heart surgery. And so uh, we got to spend time with him the last 10 years of his life and it changed our lives. He was, became our mentor. We'd go out and we'd sit in Theodore's kitchen and uh, he would be talking and he'd be drinking coffee. And I would just be sitting, be fascinated by the man. His knowledge, his history, his hands-on experience, his ability to dig trees and plant trees and uh, his passion for the business, and his willingness to help us. But the real fun was getting in the golf cart. Yeah. And sometimes you had to duck because he wasn't real careful about the overhanging, yeah, right. overhanging branches. Yeah. A lot of nurseries back in the day didn't have unusual stuff. Theodore was kind of a pioneer in, in unusual stuff, too. I had not met him, but I heard that he had this wonderful collection of, wonder, of outstanding trees, and um, I had always wanted to see them. I started a nonprofit in Louisville by the name of Botanica, uh, with the mission of having lectures, bringing in speakers from around the world to talk about horticulture, different aspects of horticulture. Somewhere along the line, we had a very big conference in the fall of 97. Theodore got a standing ovation when he walked in the door. People recognized him and what he had done for the nursery industry. I was really exhausted after putting this conference together and I was laying in bed the next morning thinking I didn't have to get up or do anything and I got a phone call and it was from Jules Klein, his son, and he was calling and saying that Papa really enjoyed coming to the conference the night before and also to the party afterwards and that Papa would like for me to come out and meet him personally and to see Udell and take a tour. And so I said, well, Jules, that sounds wonderful. Oh, maybe in a week or two? And he said, well, actually, Papa wants you to come out now. Hmm. So I got out of bed, I got dressed, and I headed out to Crestwood, and the entire family was sitting in the kitchen. And there was maybe 10 people sit, sitting around the table waiting for me with their arms crossed, and Theodore was at the head. So, a little intimidating. I thought this is an opportunity. So many people 
wanted to see his place and they never had seen it. It was a little bit bold of me, but I asked him, would it be okay if in the following spring we opened up his place, Udell Gardens, for people, a select number of people, of the industry to come in and look at his collection of trees. And he said, yes, that it sounds great. So then the following May, that would be May of 98, we had an open house. Theodore sat in a, tr in a chair right at the bottom of the steps uh, below the house, and people came up and sat next to him for a few minutes, greeted him, told him how much they enjoyed seeing the Arboretum, and got to spend a little time with him. I'm really glad we did it. The following year he died, so this gave them an opportunity to really meet with him and to talk with him and to tell them how much he, they appreciated his work. I was fortunate enough to move to Louisville uh, a little while before Theodore passed away. I had met him on a previous visit or two to the Louisville area. Mutual friends in the plant business had brought me out and had a chance to meet and take the golf cart tour and, and, and enjoy the plants and the gardens on the property. Uh, I think I was in Louisville for about a year and a half before Theodore passed away. And so during that time, I would come out and visit and, and learn from him and, and enjoy the property. He was still working in the gardens, I think right up until just a couple weeks before he passed away. Uh, in fact, we have photographs in our archives of Theodore on his hands and knees the spring of that year, planting out oak seedlings in a nursery, uh, which to me is the ultimate of the gardener ethic, right? I mean, no one plants an oak tree planning to, to you know, swing on the, the tire swing in the, under the mature oak tree. But when you're 93 years old and you're still planting oak seedlings, I, think, I don't think you can say much more than that about, about someone's garden ethic and, and approach to things. Uh, so he was very active in the garden, as active as he could be. But obviously at, at the age he was at the time, he was not able to keep up with everything in the gardens. And so while he still was out in the gardens just about every day doing something, <clears throat> his gardens were, were getting a little bit out of hand. Um, after he passed away, of course, the property sat for a couple of years uh, without daily attention. And any, as any gardener knows, it doesn't take more than about lunch hour for a garden to get out of control. The arboretum was a trampoline of vines that went from tree to tree. The greenhouses were uh, completely broken, uh, glass everywhere. They had young trees growing through the roofs. You really couldn't see the sunken garden. It was gone. It was full of weeds. The, the secret garden was Im impenetrable. Somewhere around 2000, there were a group of us, uh, partly from my garden club, who decided that something had to be done to save Udell. The early years at Udell were very interesting. The only work that happened on the grounds happened on second Saturday workdays. Second Saturday of every month, uh, from 9 a.m. till about 4 in the afternoon. We had volunteers, and sometimes we'd have two or three, but a lot of times we'd have 20, 30, 40 volunteers, because a lot of people knew Theodore or knew of Theodore. A lot of people in the industry got their start working for Theodore or buying plants from him with his support. And uh, so there was a lot of interest in helping. And so the, the sort of the, the diametrically opposed typical day at Udell was on a typical Tuesday, it would be me sitting in my office and the house would creak, and that was pretty much <laughs> that was pretty much it. And then on a second Saturday, I would come in, and we'd have three arborist crews, the South Oldham High School football team, and twenty gardeners, all looking for something to do in the garden. And uh, so it was a little overwhelming. We didn't open to the public until might have been two thousand six, because that's how much background work we had to do to get it to where people could actually come and visit. Uh, it has grown tremendously since then. We have a volunteer core of 350. We have 1,500 members. Both my grandparents would be thrilled beyond belief to see all the types of people that have come out. See, I'm used to family and my uncles and, and all the botanical Latin spoken around the kitchen table. Um, that 
other people garden too. You know, they come from all different places. Yeah, I talk about it. It's like yoga. It's like prayer time. It's very spiritual. It's just plain fun coming here to volunteer because you learn when you work along outside other people. My grandfather Theodore did it with his own two hands. It's gratifying to know that when you're here doing the work and helping um, as a volunteer or a participant, that you're really carrying on this tradition of Theodore Klein getting his hands dirty, learning about things, the education, and executing the project. The mission of UDEL has always been I think distilled down to one one phrase, and that is raising the bar of horticulture. Horticulture is one of those things that just undeniably elevates quality of life. I mean, there's there's no one who can walk into a beautiful garden and not have that day enhanced. It's it's just part of our it's part of our DNA. Whether you're walking through an an, an arboretum planting of just big, noble, beautiful trees, whether you're in a a wild garden with tropicals and contrasting colors and forms. Whether you're walking through a greenhouse and just looking at cuttings rooting in a bench, uh, sitting on your your, your back <clears throat> your back patio with a with an iced tea or a lemonade and just watching hummingbirds you know, feast on the flowers that are in the garden. Some people look at horticulture, ornamental horticulture, as an amenity, but uh, to me. Uh, without those kinds of things as part of your everyday life, life gets pretty boring and mundane. A place like Udell can make horticulture more accessible to more people and help people be more successful in their efforts, whether they're ambitious or modest. I always say if, if your only goal horticulturally one fall weekend is to plant a tree in the front yard, even if the only reason you're doing it is because everyone else in the street is doing it. Well, we want you to be as successful as possible, and we want you to get something rewarding out of that. I'm hoping people will have uh, pleasant experiences, and I know they can't all sit around the kitchen table with my grandparents, so you know, bring their own is what I want. I want them to bring their parents, grandparents, and the multi-generations come and picnic here. Welcome to Udell. Uh, I hope you enjoy your visit today, whether you've been here one time or a hundred times. Enjoy a stroll through the Arboretum, walk through all the gardens, visit the greenhouse, take a hike on the trails, and when you go home, the best thing to do is plan your next visit. <laughs>